The Word of God for our consideration this morning comes to us from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 3. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord, we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Your fellow redeemed friends in Christ who have been called by the Holy Spirit. We're two-thirds through our study of the basic confession of Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. And I don't know about you, but there's something I noticed through this study. It's that the Creed is both absolutely objective, it's, it's outside of us, the truth are outside of us, and it's very personal, it's also very subjective, and it's a part of us. Meaning this, it, the truths that are expressed in the Apostles' Creed are things that God has done, is doing, and will do, and it's completely outside of us, apart from us. That's why the Apostles' Creed is changeless. We don't submit it to a, a church council to be updated and renewed for the changing tastes of the world every few years. We don't, uh, it, it's not subject to our opinions. It doesn't matter how I feel about the truths in the Apostles' Creed because they are, have been true long before any of us were born and they will be true long after we die, whether we ever believe it or not. At the same time, it's very subjective. You can't get more subjective than saying, I believe. So how does that happen? How do objective truths that are all about what God has done, is, do is doing, and will do, how does that become mine? How does that become our personal possession? And that's the job of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. He takes objective truths outside of us and brings them into our hearts so that the Christian faith, the body of doctrine in the Bible, becomes our Christian faith, my Christian faith, your Christian faith. And so this morning we'll look at the necessity of the Holy Spirit's work and we will look at the process of his work. Now, in the minds of many people and throughout many centuries, the, the primary work of the Holy Spirit has been considered to be dispensing unique, supernatural, spiritual gifts, like speaking in tongues, performing miracles or acts of healing, or, or giving uh, divine visions directly from God. And it appears that this false idea of the Holy Spirit's primary work had infected the church in Corinth. Uh, if you, if you know the book of Corinthians at all, you know that there were many different issues dividing the congregation in Corinth, and among them was this false idea regarding the gifts of the Spirit. The, it appears that there was this idea that if a person was truly a believer, truly had faith, truly had the gift of the Holy Spirit, then the evidence would be that they had some kind of special, supernatural, spiritual gift. They would be able to speak in tongues, for example. They would they would be able to perform works of healing or other uh, mystical things. And this was dividing the church. They considered that if you had these special gifts, you were truly a believer. If you didn't have that ability to do something special, well, you're, we'll let you come, but you're a second-class believer, or if even a believer at all. If you're at all familiar with the, the Pentecostal charismatic movement in our own nation, you know that this emphasis, this pressure to cultivate special spiritual gifts, speaking in tongues, having visions from God, being able to, to do miracles or healing, that's still emphasized to this day. The truly scary thing is that the Bible warns us, and Paul especially in 2 Thessalonians, he warns us that if there are works and wonders and miracles happening, but they're not happening in conjunction with the gospel of Christ, those don't come from the Holy Spirit. Those come from the devil. And so, 
while Paul will put this false understanding of spirituality in its right place, he will, he will assure the congregation that the Holy Spirit does give us special gifts, but they're all to be used for the building up of the body of Christ. He doesn't start with those things. He doesn't start talking about speaking in tongues or doing miracles or having visions from God. He starts with the one gift of the Holy Spirit that is absolutely necessary for salvation. That's faith in Christ Jesus. Paul says very simply, no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be cursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, when we say that faith is necessary for salvation, we have to be very careful how we speak about it. There, there's a narrow Lutheran biblical middle road and there are, there are ditches of false doctrine on either side. The first ditch that we might fall into is the assumption that if I have to have faith, then somehow what Jesus did on the cross is not sufficient. There's, there's something that needs to be added to it. Maybe Jesus did 99.9%, .9 but I need to add faith, and that's the, the last tenth of a percent. But that's not true. When Jesus suffered and died on the cross, he completed all the work that will ever need to be done to redeem us, to save us. His life is perfectly adequate to cover us with the righteousness that God demands. His death is the only thing able and the only thing necessary to pay for our sins. It's finished. It really is. There's nothing more to be done to be saved. You are redeemed by Christ. You don't need anything more than him. But nothing less than him will suffice. So that's one ditch. And then the other ditch that, that people can fall into is, is assuming that because Jesus died for the whole world, well, then all people will be saved. And that would seem to make sense. Jesus paid for the sins of the world with his blood. Why aren't all people going to be saved? And that's simply because Scripture is clear that faith is necessary. The only way that that the, the precious gifts that Jesus died to win for us on the cross become ours is through faith. Paul says in Romans, and we stand with him, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And that's why, no matter what page of Scripture you turn to, it's, it's filled with calls to believe. Jesus' first message as he started preaching in his ministry was repent and believe the good news. Or think of Paul and that, that jailer is standing at his feet or, or kneeling at his feet and he's, he's begging him, what must I do to be saved? And Paul doesn't say nothing, it'll all be fine. He says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Or consider Jesus' rule, the rule by which he will divide all humanity into those who will be damned and those who will be saved. He says in Mark chapter 16, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And so we can see from Scripture that faith is necessary for salvation. But that leaves us with a couple of questions that are sometimes problematic. As if, if Jesus died for all sins, then why will some people be damned? Or if if Jesus saved me, but I need, to re, I need to believe it in order to be saved, don't I get a little bit of the credit when it comes to my salvation? Or, if all it takes is faith, what do we need the Holy Spirit for? There's a warning with the answers to those questions. The warning is that they are highly offensive. In fact, if the world were to get wind of the fact that we teach and believe this, I have no doubt that we would be destroyed on social media. Because the fact of the matter is that Jesus alone has accomplished our salvation. And that salvation is appropriated, is made our own through faith alone. But that last element, faith, is not within our ability to gin it up, to create it, to, to make it, happen in our own hearts. We are not, by our own reason, by our own strength, able to believe in Jesus Christ or come to him, as Luther says. It's not a, 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 a something that we can 
create by our conscious decision. It's not a, a rational act to make. It's not something we're born with. We are not born believers. No one is born a believer. We are not able to do it on our own because the Bible says that we are dead in sin. We are blind. We are hostile to God. We are what Ezekiel saw in his vision. We are dead, dry bones by nature. And so if, if even faith were up to us, we would all be lost. And our, our reason and our emotions and our pride do not want to accept that. We're revolted by that because, just take this morning for example, we rationalize in our own minds, well, Jesus may have saved me, but I'm the one who got up and got out of bed and came to church this morning. That's something I did, right? And the Bible's answer is, you wouldn't have done that if God had not remade you. So, if we're going to approach this doctrine, this highly offensive doctrine, we must submit our reason and our emotions and most of all our pride to the written word of Scripture. And Scripture is painstakingly clear that faith is not within the ability of humanity to do. Paul says earlier in this letter, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And then he wrote to the Romans, the sinful mind, the, the mind that we are all born with, is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. And so we confess with Martin Luther, I believe that I can cannot, by my own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. We confess that we are Christians, but it's not because of us. We don't get the credit, and that is not an easy confession to make. Many will not make it. Some try to twist it or warp it to try to find a place for our own ability but we confess it. We admit, Lord, I believe, but I don't get any credit for it. Because that is what Scripture tells us. That being said, the, the fact that we believe that we are unable to come to faith by ourselves is based on Scripture alone. But when you accept it, you do begin to see evidence of it. For example, think of how many Jews in Jesus' day witnessed his miracles, saw him change water into wine and, and heal people who were sick, um, who saw him raise dead people back to life. Even how many Jews do you think walked past the empty tomb and, and saw the evidence and said, yeah, he apparently rose from the dead, and yet they still rejected him. Reason would tell him, Yes, this guy is not just a normal human being. He must be the Son of God, but they still didn't believe. Or think of how many people in our own world today, how many very talented, very smart people there are, and they, they work their tails off to achieve the best this world can offer, wealth and fame and power, and yet they, they don't have a minute to spare to chase after the most valuable treasure of all, eternal life. Or think closer to home. Think of Christians who have been baptized, who have confessed their faith in Christ as Lord, and yet they continue to walk in the ways of darkness. They may have said at one point that Jesus is their friend, and yet they continue to dance with the devil. They are, they are confirmed in the Christian faith, and yet they don't live as though Jesus were the Lord of their life. And then consider talking to them and trying to show them the error of their ways, trying to try to bring them to repentance and to see that Jesus is truly their Savior and their Redeemer. And you know how hard that is to show someone, even a Christian, that they are sinful and need a Savior. Or maybe most humbling of all, consider ourselves. Consider 
how often we know what God's will is and yet we do just the opposite. Or how often our faith so, feels so weak and we, we really struggle to, to accept the truths of Scripture. We can even see in ourselves the, the remnants of that spiritual deadness that we were born in. We can even see the evidence in our own lives that if it's up to us, there's no way I am trusting that Jesus Christ is my Savior. So it is absolutely necessary for the Holy Spirit to perform that work on us. Because as Paul says very clearly, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. To put it another way, and I, this is the way I would put it with my confirmation class, children, Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, everything that we learn in the first and second article, everything that Jesus has done for us, is about as useful to us as a, a check written out in your name for a million dollars that is laying on the surface of the moon. It's about as beautiful a thing as, as a, a, a work of art is to a blind man. It's about as useful to you as a, a cure for cancer is to someone who has already died of cancer. Because that's how the Bible portrays us. It portrays us as completely helpless, like a dead person, as, as blind as any blind person, as deaf to the good news of the gospel as any, as any deaf person living. It doesn't do us any good, everything that Jesus did apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, which makes the Holy Spirit's work absolutely necessary for us. Because no one, in their own ability, by their own reason, by their own strength, will ever come to Jesus Christ or believe in Him. But the good news is, and this is very good news, the good news is that when the Holy Spirit goes to work, anyone, from the, the newborn infant who is, who is brought to the baptismal font to, to the most violent persecutor of Christians like Paul himself, to someone suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's, to all of us, when the Holy Spirit goes to work on us, even we can believe that Jesus is Lord, confess it, and truly believe it. So that's a necessity of the work of the Holy Spirit. What about the process? How does the Holy Spirit perform His work? And that's, that's kind of a... a a confused thing too in our world. How would you say that the Holy Spirit does His work? How does a person come to faith? What's the, the first step in the process? We might say, well, parents deciding to bring their child to, to baptism. That's the first step. Or, or a person uh, waking up one morning and saying, you know what, there's a church on the corner, I think I'm going to walk into it. Or, or maybe in some places, uh, someone making the decision and raising their hand and saying, yes, I would like to invite Jesus Christ into my heart. Are those the first steps to coming to faith? Not if faith is a gift, as the Bible says it is. Because if faith is a gift, the first step must be the giver wanting to give it to us. God must make the conscious decision and effort to give us the gift of faith. We call that the call. Luther confesses and will confess with him, the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. And so no one comes to faith apart from God calling and inviting them. A lot of people think today that, that it's somehow within our power and our ability to seek out God and find him and kind of make him ours. And if you look at the Bible, if you look at Bible history, what do you see? Do you see masses of people searching out God and finding him and grabbing him? No, you see God chasing down people who are more often than not running away from him. Think of Adam and Eve in the garden. They're trying to hide from him in the trees. God comes and finds them and promises to save them from their sin. Think of the Israelites constantly going their own way and God sending prophet after prophet to lead them to repentance, to bring them back to faith. Uh, Think of the prophet Ezekiel in a different part of his book. He's, he declares to Israel that it's not God's will that anyone should perish, but that everyone should turn to him, 
believe and be saved. God is always the one who initiates faith. He calls us to faith. And that's the specific work of the Holy Spirit, continuing to send out people, men and women, pastors and teachers, to every corner of the planet to invite people to believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus gives a beautiful picture of, of how this works in a parable he told in, in Luke's gospel. He, he describes heaven like a, a great banquet, and he says that, that God, the, the, the one who's putting on the banquet, sends out messengers to all the corners of the city, and, and he invites everyone to come. And, and unfortunately, not everyone does. Unfortunately, some make up excuses. They say, oh, I just got married. I can't come. Or, oh, I got to plow my field. I can't come to the banquet. And then the, the master says, well, go to, the, go to the poor, go to the street urchins, go to the needy, go to the lowest levels of society, go and call them. Tell them there's a banquet prepared that they could never afford on their own. Invite them to, to come and to eat. And, and that's exactly what Jesus continues to do. That's why he sends his spirit and sends pastors and teachers and men and women and parents and grandparents to tell the next generation about how good God is. And that's how the Holy Spirit carries out His work. He doesn't do it by giving us visions or dreams. He doesn't generally do it by giving us the ability to heal or to speak in tongues. He does it through very simple means like the Word and water and bread and wine. He issues the call to one and all to repent and believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And wherever that call goes out, the Holy Spirit is there. You don't have to feel it. I don't care if you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit today. I don't, I don't care if you don't believe that just because we have a banner and candles lit that the Holy Spirit is here. Believe that the Holy Spirit is here because the Word of God is here. That's what he calls you to. And, and when you have been called, the Holy Spirit enlightens you. That's, that's a technical term that, that we may or may not have to use for the creation of faith. It's that spark of understanding that says, I think the word of God is right. I think when God says that I'm a poor, miserable sinner that doesn't deserve anything but his wrath, I believe that to be true. And then I believe the other good part of the, the Bible too, that God sent his son into the world to redeem a poor, worthless sinner like me. That's the spark of faith. And whether that's strong or that's weak, whether it's just a flickering flame or a roaring fire, that is saving faith. And then by calling and enlightening Individual hearts like ours, the Holy Spirit gathers the church and he keeps it in Jesus Christ until we die or the last day will come. So those are the rough steps of the work of the Holy Spirit, the process by which he creates faith in human hearts. And we'll look further at that process in upcoming sermons. But for us this morning, it's enough that we Accept and believe Paul's simple words that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be cursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. God's plan of salvation was always perfect. He was always going to do exactly what he said he was going to do. And Jesus did it. It's complete. It's finished. But that wouldn't do anyone any good unless it would, the Holy Spirit goes to work on our hearts. In humility, and I know it's hard, in humility understand that you don't get any credit for your faith. In humility thank the Holy Spirit for creating that spark of faith in your heart. And over the next several weeks, rejoice that we get to see how the Holy Spirit carries out his work. But above all, give thanks. Because the, the Holy Spirit has gone to work on your heart. So that you can say that Jesus is not just the Savior. Jesus 
is my Savior. Then the Holy Spirit's work will be revealed in your heart.